Amen. Praise the Lord. Landmark Tabernacle family, thank you for joining us this evening for this time of praise and worship. Uh, we want to invite you today to just welcome the presence of God into your home and worship with us. Amen. The name that is above all names, the name that can heal, the name that can save, the name that can restore, amen, and bring freedom into our lives. Amen. So worship with us here tonight in Jesus' mighty name. is 
powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. How many of you can testify to break every chain? Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of above every name I promise you the enemy is going to back away from that hallelujah it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight and to be with all of you I I've missed getting to see all of you but that doesn't mean that I haven't prayed for you and somehow or another I feel that in prayer in your prayer there's been our getting together and fellowshipping with God around the throne of God. 
Amen. We're so thankful for all that you have done and the prayers you have prayed for me and my wife, my, the passing of my brother and the cards and letters and people that have texted and emailed and so on. I appreciate it so very, very much. I want to go right to the right to the word of the Lord tonight. And I, I, I try to title this, this lesson, something that I hope will stick in your thinking. Because at a time such as this, I, I feel like the Lord has given me this word to help you and to talk to you about God does business only with those who mean business. No, no, no. It's not, it's not trivialities. It's not someone making a little joke here and there about heaven and all of that and eternity and so forth. No, no, no. God only does business with those that mean business. So I want to go to Matthew, the seventh chapter, and begin at the seventh verse. And this is what the word says. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Many, many years ago when I used to study to improve myself, and I think everybody should. Uh, I would get leadership materials and that type of thing and teach myself so that I could teach others. One of the things that was brought out was that a, an instructor, I guess it was a professor, and he brought to the class a very large glass jar and uh, puts this jar on that and says, I want to teach you something. And so he takes some big rocks and begins to put inside of that jar until it had come to the top with these big rocks. Then he asked the question, um, is this jar full? Of course, the answer was yes by the students. And then he reaches down and he picks up a little bag of small pebbles and begins to pour it among those big rocks and sh shake the jar a little bit and filled it up. Then he made the statement, he says, is this jar full? They said, yes, it's full. He reaches down, grabs a little bag of fine sand and begins to pour it into the jar, shakes it a little bit, and then levels it off. Is this jar full? And well, by that time, they knew that there was something else that they were supposed to be learning, but they did say, yes, it's full. So he brings out a pitcher of water and pours into that jar until he fills it up. He said, what have you learned here? Somebody, somebody raised their hand and said, uh, I learned that no matter how much you think that you've got in the jar, there's always a little room for some more. He said, oh, no, that's not the lesson to learn here. The lesson that I want to teach you is this, that if you didn't put the big rocks in first, you would have never got it into the jar. And then he made reference to the fact that the big things in life, the big things in life, you, they will never clamor for your time. You'll never have them crying out saying, you need to do me first, you need to do this. But you have to plan, first of all, to do the big things, and then the other things can be added in. Well, what I'm talking about tonight is prayer. Prayer, to me, is the biggest thing 
that you and I could ever do. And so uh, I, I was sitting a few weeks ago before the virus hit. I was in general board meetings in St. Louis, Missouri. And I sat around a table where there was about eight or 10 uh, general super, uh, district superintendents from various districts. The man that was sitting to my right was the man that I went to Africa with and uh, we hunted together. And he, he, he happened to stay in the room right next to me. He said, uh, Brother Hale, do you still get up and pray at 4 o'clock in the morning like you did in Africa? And uh, he said, uh, he told all the district superintendents around, he said, I, I would hear him wake me up 4 o'clock every morning, and, and I could hear prayer going on. I said, yes, sir. Uh, I haven't let up on that. Well, one of the superintendents uh, over on my left, he said, he backed up his chair and he said, now, Brother Hale, why in the world would you do that to yourself? Get up that early in the morning when you could wait and you could talk to God and uh, during the day because God, God doesn't slumber or sleep and so on. He began to kind of give me a little reprimand about doing that. And I said, no, uh, God, uh, God does hear. And God would hear what every time of the day or night. There's no question about that. It's not that God hears and that I'm concerned about. I know God hears. But it's me getting this thing done, first of all, before I ever walk out the front door, I want to make sure the big thing is taken care of. And so this is why I'm bringing to you tonight that God does business only with those that mean business. If you were in an accident, you could, uh, and you lost a limb, God forbid, but it's possible for you to be fitted with an artificial leg to replace your natural leg. If, 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 you, if you don't want to use a phone, you can, you can find a substitute. You can email, you can fax, you can do all kinds of things, Facebook and so on, to get your message across. But what I want to teach to you tonight, you cannot substitute. There is no substitute for prayer. Other things may be good and fine in themselves, but they're not a substitute for prayer. Eloquence. I love eloquence. I love to hear people that can that uh, were are wordsmiths and so on. But that's not a substitute for prayer. Enthusiasm or intellectualism or energy or whatever is no substitute for prayer. Because there is no substitute for prayer. In my estimation, prayer is the greatest untapped and unused force in all the world. People always trying to tap into energy. Scientists, I understand, trying their best now to learn how they can use the energy of the ocean the tides and the ebb and flow and the waves that sweep in, but uh, there's no substitute for the greatest energy that you can have, and that is prayer. We've learned how to tap into the nuclear uh, power, but that, my friend, is no, it's not compared to the power that's in prayer. Praise God. I hope that you receive what I'm saying tonight. One of my favorite examples of prayers in the book of Acts, where the church, now this is in the church age. This is not back in the Old Testament. This is not Elijah and Elisha. This is not back in those times or even Moses. This is in the church age. This is since the church was started. The church people got together at somebody's house, and they began to pray because Peter, it looked like, 
was going to be killed, and uh, they began to pray. I love this example of prayer. I, I want so badly sometimes for it to happen, and you know what? It probably has happened, and I just didn't see the angel that went in front of Peter unlocking the doors and saying, just follow me right on out. Peter thinks he's sleepwalking. Uh, according to the scripture, he thinks he's seeing a vision and all of that, and he gets to the outside, and the angel leaves and departs. Well, where does he go? The Bible says he went to that house where prayer was being offered and knocks on the door, and the little girl comes to it and screams and runs and turns back and says, it's Peter at the door. Peter's at the door. They said, oh, no, you must have seen his angel. I mean, they praying, but uh, that's just uh, going through the motions. No, 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 they were sincere. They were sincere. She finally talked them into it, and uh, Peter came into the house. I love that because something was initiated there on earth that operated in the spiritual realm where angels were brought down. Now, I can't get off my subject because I get, I, get, I get carried away with this very thought. Amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 where Jesus said clearly and plainly, and I have no reason to doubt any word that he speaks. He says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts, give good things to them that ask him? So quickly, I want to divide this up into three easy divisions tonight in talking about prayer. The first is the reason for prayer. Now I know, I know folks, that's common sense will tell you that prayer changes things. Prayer really does change things. But a lot of people feel they're smarter than common sense. <laughs> And uh, so I want to, first of all, talk about the reasons for prayer. Why does God want us to pray? Jesus taught very clearly that our Heavenly Father knows what we have need of before we even ask. Now, why does God want us to pray? He already knows what our needs are, and the Word of God points out he wants to give us our needs. He wants us to have uh, our needs met. So why do we have to tell God what we have need of? He already knows that. And then why do we have to ask him what he already wants to give us? Because he loves us. Have you ever thought about the mystery of prayer? The mystery of prayer why do we pray? All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 and 8. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So I learned some things right here. I want, I want to teach it to you. I learned some things. First of all, we don't pray to impress God. God's not impressed. If you try to be like Shakespeare and you try to pray in the King James English or you try to be like a poet and uh, you speak in poetic language, that really doesn't impress God. Now, when I was a young child, I was around preachers a lot because we kept them in our home for special speaking and so forth. 
and I heard a lot of prayer. Now, folks, I honestly heard some good poetic prayers. I heard, I heard people that was praying in a poetic sense, and, and they meant every word of it. So it must have been something natural to them. I'll just say this. I was impressed. As a child, I was impressed. But God says, don't use vain repetition. Let's look at verse 8. You do not pray to inform God. It says, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. We don't pray to impress God, and we don't pray to inform God. Amen. So what do we do when we pray? We invite God. We invite God to come into our situation and to be in our hearts and in our lives. I want that. I want to walk with God. I want to walk with God and talk with God. And so I want this wonderful routine and I want this wonderful habit called prayer. Amen. God can run this universe without us. I can tell you that. You know that. But there's something that's called the delight factor. I'm going to use that in my terminology. The delight factor. Why do we invite God? Three reasons. Three reasons. Number one, the delight factor. Amen. If God ran this universe without us, giving us the privilege of working with him, uh, what a tragedy that would be. Amen. But he invites us. Come alongside, the Lord says. Come along with me to administrate the needs of of this whole universe. Look at John chapter 15. Jesus speaking of himself as the vine and you and I as the branches. John 15 and 4. He says, abide in me. Abide in me. Dwell in me, he says. I've caught myself many times in prayer with this, these very words. Lord, I want to abide in you. I want you to abide in me. I didn't realize it, but I'll explain to you in a moment. I was already abiding. That's what prayer is all about. That's what prayer is. He said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. Amen. And then in just a moment, he takes that verse of Scripture and brings it in and starts talking about prayer. He is saying that prayer is to get us to abide in him. He says in, in 15 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done to you. Prayer is a way that bonds you and I to God. Does that sound like something you want? Does that sound like something you need in an hour like we're in right now? I think it would be. I think it would be. Amen. We can't do it without him. We can't do it without him. I can't. I can't save my family without him. I can't, I can't heal myself without him. And he won't do it without us. Okay, I want to give you a little illustration to put this in your thinking. I used this with my family some time ago. I've always been enamored with flying. My brother, when I was in high school, <clears throat> was training to get his pilot's license and uh, he wanted me to fly with him well I was interested in that he turned uh, the plane over to me and I'd never flown a plane before and so I'm just dipping the wings and trying to turn the plane and 
And that's not the way you turn a plane. It's just by doing the steering column like that. And so I were just kind of rocking along. But he got me interested in flying. And just before I came to Denver, I was taking pilot's lessons. And when I got here after about a year or so, I had a number of hours. And I said, you know, I might as well go ahead and finish flying. So I put in the time, the effort, the energy, the study, and got my pilot's license. So one day, I was going to a minister's conference in Pueblo, Colorado, and uh, I decided I'm going to take a rent a plane. I'm going to fly down. After the conference is over with, I'll get back in the plane and fly back. I shared that with my instructor, and he says, so, Billy, I think I need to go with you. I said, oh, no, you don't, you don't need to do that. I mean, all these hours that you'll have to be waiting at the airport or somewhere, you don't need to be doing that. I'll be fine. I'll, I'll uh, just go down and come back right after the meeting. No, he said, I think uh, I need to go with you. Uh, I don't mind doing it. And so I said, okay, well, that's fine. If you want to go with me, I'm, I'm all for that. So he steps over there in the passenger seat. I fly to Pueblo and land the plane, get out and go to the meeting. I come back. I didn't check good enough, really, with the weather and what was about to happen. And uh, here I am. I have my private license, but I don't have my instrument rating. And so we're up now and we're flying home. And all of a sudden, I can't see the ground. I can't see out yonder. I can't see around me. We're in some dark clouds. And uh, I kind of looked over to him. I said, I think uh, you better take control here because I don't have my instrument rating. Well, he let me fly and use all the controls and, until we got to the clouds. I couldn't have done it by myself, folks. I couldn't have made it by myself. He could have made it without me, but I couldn't have made it without him. I use that to tell you this. You can't make it without God. You can't make it. He can make this the whole thing work without you and I. But I'm glad somehow or another. He says, I want you to come get in this passenger seat and I'll help you. You can fly a little bit. You can do a little bit of the, the partner with me and get things done. And I want you to help me to operate. Folks, I appreciate so very much the power of prayer. I don't take it for granted. I don't wait till I get in a crisis and then all of a sudden I run to my prayer closet and beat the carpet and plead and beg God. No, no, no. I want to have this thing so in tune with God that within five minutes of me praying, I want to be in the spirit. I want to be abiding. My Lord, I feel the presence of the Lord just talking about it. Amen. Abiding in the spirit. Praise God. That's what I call the delight factor. All right? Then there's something called the development factor. Write it down. This is important. These are very important things that will help you in your prayer life. I've been, I've been preaching for 50-something years, and I've learned these things actually work. They're not just good lessons. They actually work. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you know that when you're praying, that it's one of the ways in which God causes us to grow and to mature. Did you know that? Did you know that that's the way God will develop your life? You're not the person. If you've been in church for any length of time, you're not the person you started out with. You might have received the greatest experience and have the greatest testimony of deliverance. But I can promise you, if you are a person of prayer, you're not the same individual as when you got into this. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to clap my hands for you tonight. 
Amen. And give God praise and thanks for what I feel in this house in the name of Jesus. So here's what he says, John 15 and 7 again. But if you abide in me, dwell in me, and my words dwell in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. Sometimes we pray, and the answer doesn't seem to come. You've all experienced that, and so have I. And so we, we start studying the Word of God. Why didn't I get an answer? We start seeking the face of the Lord. We start growing in grace and the knowledge of God until the answer comes. But you will find the scripture where it talks about wait on the Lord. That doesn't mean to get you a good soft chair somewhere, rock a little bit and wait for God to do it all. No, no, no. When you're waiting on God, you are actually communicating with God. Amen. You are actually talking to the Lord. I'm reminded of the boy that uh, I learned about some time ago. He wanted to date this girl, and she wouldn't date him. <clears throat> so he'd ask her to go out, and she says no. And he'd leave, and he'd say, I wonder why she won't go out with me. Could it be my hygiene? So he goes in, brushes his teeth real good, and uh, uses Listerine and puts a little of his daddy's aftershave lotion on and comes back. And uh, she says no. And he leaves and he says, I wonder why. I wonder why. I wonder if it's the way I dress. So he changes his dress and uh, decides he's going to look a little bit better. And so he comes back and asks her to go out with him. And she says, no. He comes back and he says, I don't know what all I'm doing. Maybe it's my manners. Maybe I need to learn how to have better manners. And so he changes and he goes back and asks her uh, to go out with him. And she says, yes. Yes. <laughs> I could have told him a long time ago, women are hard to figure out. But anyway, here's the thing I'm trying to get you to see. Amen. All the time that he'd been asking her, he had been improving himself. He had become more and more acceptable unto her. And I think that's one of the things that prayer does for you and I. We ask God for something, and the answer doesn't come right away. We ask him again, could it be that I'm selfish? Could it be that I lack faith? Could it be I lack commitment? So prayer is not only delight, but prayer is development, and it helps us to grow in Jesus Christ. Now, the third thing here that I use is dependence. Okay, delight and uh, development and dependence. God never wants us to live without him. So he says, abide in me. I'm the vine. John 15 and 5. Let's look at that. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. No, no, no. God doesn't say you can do something. He said, you can't do anything without me. So, be so tragic, as I said before, for our God to run this universe and leave us out because we will never know the delight of prayer and we will never grow and mature and complete ourselves in God. Folks, you will never reach any percentage of your potential, none without being men and women of prayer. You might as well just make it up in your mind. The devil's going to do everything he can to stop you and put everything he can in your path to distract you. But just remember what Brother Hale said at the beginning. Put the big rocks in first. Do the big things first. Your Bible study. 
I get through praying. Most of the times I sit down immediately and open my Bible. Because at that point, I want some of this anointing that came out of prayer to kind of flow across that Word of God because I have a kind of a thick skull and getting something through to me, I have to work at it, push at it, and so do you. Amen, amen, amen. So we learn to depend upon God. Okay, I've given you the reason for prayer. The second thing I want to give to you is the request in prayer. Matthew 7 and 7, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. We're commanded. That's a commandment. God commanded us to ask. The great problem in prayer is not unanswered prayer, but it's unoffered prayer. If you don't pray, you're not going to get an answer. James 4 and 2, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you have not because why? You didn't even offer to ask. And that's what Jesus said. He says that we're to ask. Unoffered prayer is not just a tragedy. It's a sin, according to this scripture. Luke, the 18th chapter in the first verse, and he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not to faint. Mark 14, 38, good scripture. Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Folks, nobody is going to escape this world that's not going to go through a lot of temptations. I promise you, I don't care what missionary or what great man of God, Jesus was even tempted. Think about that. But the Lord says, watch ye and pray, lest you enter into those temptations. For the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And he was talking to his disciples. In the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6, and I'm, I'm hurrying on. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So prayer, it appears just from these few scriptures. Prayer ought to be as natural as breathing. It ought to be as natural as breathing. My mother, she was a true Christian, loved God. I don't know of anybody in that loved God any more than her. And I remember when I was not even in church or going or even really tried, I'd be in the house, and I'd, my mother, walking from the kitchen table over, take the dishes to the sink, so forth, and, walk, and I could hear her praying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you, Jesus. Amen. It was just natural, just like breathing to her. Amen. And the reason is this. If it concerns you, it concerns God. And God wants to be a part of what concerns you. Amen. Can there be anything too big for God? Okay. I sat there just a few moments ago before I stepped to this pulpit. I looked around, of course we're restricted and, and can't have a lot of people here at all, really. I see a lot of empty pews. I remember the time that uh, I wanted a choir so bad and I'd look up as I would camp out basically in the auditorium years ago, just praying hours in prayer, walking and laying hands on pews and, 
and people that would sit there, I would pray God, touch them, and so on. But I would look up in the choir loft, and i said, say, Lord, look at that big choir that's there. Look at those wonderful singers that's up there. There wasn't a soul up there. I look at these wonderful musicians, and I thank you for them, and I am so glad. Well, folks, that had to be by faith. There's nothing too big for God. I am talking to somebody right now. I don't know where you are or who you are. But the anointing of God right now is on me to tell you that you can't ask anything too much for God. He is able to take care of your situation, and he will do it. Our responsibility is asking. God's responsibility is, is bringing it to pass and giving. And that's what he says in his scripture. He can't do his responsibility until we do ours, and that's ask. Hallelujah. And then he makes this statement. He says to seek. Well, if you're seeking for something, you're on a quest. You're looking for something. Amen. So not only a desire in prayer, but discernment in prayer. You're seeking. You're on a quest. If you're seeking something lost and unknown, you're trying to get some things figured out and to discover some things. <laughs> I want so bad to stop and give a little illustration here and yonder. Folks, I've got myself in a lot of messes. And I have forgotten things and laid them down, my car keys here and yon and various things and I've prayed these prayers. I don't know if it works every time, but it's worked for me, and I thank God for it. I mean, the Lord would give me a little word, and I would find my car keys. Now, that's a powerful thing to me. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting at the computer, and I was going to take care of something, and I heard this little voice said, don't do it. Well, it didn't appear that it was going to be bad at all. And so, I mean, it wasn't sin. And I heard this little voice say, don't do it. So I got up from the computer. I walked away. And I walked around a while and I come back and I thought, well, I'm on take care of this business here and the Lord says don't do it and I believe it was the Lord because I'll tell you what I'm thrilled to death today I want to live that close to God so that he can breathe in just a little whisper and I can be sensitive to the voice of God does that appeal to you out there does that really appeal to you is that something you'd like to have in your life, then you've got to talk to God. Amen. Desire the Lord and have discernment. Seek the Lord. Amen. Prayer is not only a matter of desire. It's a matter of discernment as well. We may be praying sometimes out of the will of God. We may be asking for things that God don't want us to have. Amen. So if that's true. I don't think God's going to bless something that he's not pleased with us to do. Amen. James chapter 4 verse 8. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh unto you. It may be that God just wants you to come close. He said about his people Jerusalem as the mountains are about Jerusalem so do I want to be about my people. He said in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I want you to put a girdle on. Well, back then they wore girdles, men and women, because they had such loose clothing, they had to kind of tie them up and tie them across their waist and so forth. And then you had to tie it tight. And God says, as the gir girdle girdeth up the loins of a man, that's 
how close I want to be with you and you with me. That's pretty tight. I want me and God to be tight. Hallelujah. Man, I feel like praying. I feel like worshiping. I thank God for what is in this room. Okay. All right. It says James 5 and 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So here we are. There's desire to pray. Ask. And then there is discernment. Seek. Then there's the third thing. Knock. And knock is determination. That's determination. What you going to knock on? You knock on closed doors. Right? You knock on closed doors, and when you pray, you have to keep knocking on that door until it opens. The enemy is going to throw barriers between you and that answered prayer, and you've got to overcome them. You've got to keep coming over. Amen. Amen. Actually, in the original, it literally means this, to keep on knocking, to keep on knocking. Sometimes God answers immediately. All right, I want, I want almost to walk around and jump around and everything else. But uh, I, want to, I want to give you a little illustration. God gives answers direct and immediate sometimes. Uh, years ago, oh, this has probably been in 1979, we were needing another building, and so... I went a little scouting trip and pulled up to an empty church building or a church building that was for sale. Pulled over to the side of the curb and I was in just a little bitty Toyota and uh, just a little, I could hardly even bend over and get in the thing. It was so small. But I decided after I had looked at everything and I'd pull out and so I eased out and turned away from the curb and when I did, I didn't clear the, the, the road like I should have. And this huge gasoline truck came and, and, and just within a half inch, within a half inch, I think it even knocked the chrome off the side where the big bumper was, was my head and neck. I would have been killed instantly. Something happened. I don't know if angels can get that thin to get into that, but it must be they can because I was spared. My, that was just a little bit of hitting the side of my vehicle knocked me back on the curb. It was just such a huge bit, truck. I was so shaken. This was before cell phones and so forth. I went and got on the phone as quick as I could call my wife. I was just I was trembling. I was so shaken. And I said, um, what are you doing? She said, well, a while ago I got in such a feeling that I need to go into prayer. <laughs> Thank God for somebody that uh, is sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Because I told her, I said, you know why? Yeah, I said, I just almost lost my life. And an angel came and saved me. And it was your prayers that brought that immediate response from God. Amen. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he delays it. The apostle Paul prayed three times and God says no, no. And he said okay. But if it's just delaying, then you've got to keep on knocking. Here Jesus is talking in Luke 11. He's talking about prayer. And he, this is the disciples had requested. It says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children 
are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I, I want you to get this picture. I'm coming to a close. But I want you to get this picture with me. They didn't have big, big homes with all kinds of rooms and kitchen over here or and dining room and so on. One big room mostly. And so when they went to bed, they all just spread out on the floor and they were in bed together. And back then, a lot of times they brought animals inside. They didn't have big barns and so on, so they just bring them inside. And uh, so you can understand, I want you to see this picture. You can understand, here's a man, that uh, friend dropped by. He didn't have anything to give him. He said, you know what, I got a friend. I'm going to go to my friend and see if he'll give me some bread. So he goes, knocks on the door, and the man inside says, no, uh, my kid's in bed. You got the dogs barking. You got the animals moving around. No, I'm not going to do it. And the Lord says, uh, Luke uh, chapter 11, verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give it because he's a friend. Friendship goes so far. But the Lord is trying to teach us something. He said, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. And, the, and then the Lord says to the disciples, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I don't think it's God's reluctance to answer prayer. I think there's various reasons. This is one of them. It's God only does business with those who mean business. When Daniel in the Old Testament, one of the most vivid, one of the most uh, incredible stories to me, one of the things that helps my prayer as much as anything I know is when he was in his 21 days of seeking God and fasting. After 21 days, the angel came to him and says, Daniel, I heard you the first day. Well, Okay, how come I didn't get my answer? He said, the reason you didn't get your answer is because I was hindered. There's all kinds of demonic spirits that are warring and trying to keep the answer from coming. Folks, I don't know about you, but this adds to my faith that some way or another, I'm going to keep paying the price. I'm going to keep on asking. I'm going to keep on knocking until that door opens. And listen, it's not only for my benefit, but according to what happened with Daniel, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God destroyed some of the works of the devil. And amen. And there was holes prayed in the sky where the angels could come ascend and be sent. Don't you want angels of God to come live in your home, be around you and your children? Praise God. Oh, I've got so much more I want to talk about, but I want to draw to a close with this and let you know something. One of the things that has impressed me about prayer is the scripture says, Pray that you may be accounted worthy. Oh, wow. I know Jesus is always worthy. But the Lord says if I pray and you pray, that's going to be accounted worthy on the account sheet of my life. Amen. I love you. I hope somehow or another I have touched your heart to let you know that if you mean business with God, God will deal with you because God only does business with those that mean business. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you right now for this awesome anointing that I feel 
in this almost completely empty building. Me and you, Lord, thank you. But not only that, I know that there are hundreds and maybe thousands of people that's out there that are learning something that if they can keep on asking, that, Lord, it's not only going to bring the answer to them, but on the way, the angel is going to destroy the dark works of demonic spirits that tries to hinder the kingdom of God. Bless now, I pray, O oh Lord, every family. I pray, O oh Lord, for our preachers. I pray, O oh God, for our missionaries right now, dealing with issues like they've never dealt with before. Help us, O oh God, to all join together. O oh Lord, unite and band together as great, powerful men and women that can come to the throne of God in prayer and see an answer. God bless you is my prayer. Looking forward to seeing you in church, in the spirit, or ever how we get together this weekend. God bless you. Amen.